we are in Romans chapter 1. Romans and the first chapter. Uh, the major section of the book of Romans. After uh, introductory material, and we uh, cover the overall first 17 verses, but the point of the book of Romans is going to uh, demonstrate the power of the gospel of God to bring about salvation for all human beings. So we uh, noted that in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for everyone or to everyone who believes. And so he's establishing the universal need for the gospel. And you begin with the fact that we are all sinners. And what he does in verses 18 through verse 32 of chapter 1, the rest of chapter 1, is demonstrate that all humanity, particularly talking about non-Jews, because he's talking about the general creation, uh, natural revelation available to all people as a result of the creating work of God, demonstrates that all people are sinners in their rejection of God as he has revealed himself. Then in chapter 2, he'll do, deal with the Jews specifically because they have the special revelation of God, his word. But they are just as lost and just as condemned as the Gentiles are. And the conclusion he wants to come to, to remind you over in chapter 3, Verse 9, the last, uh, pick up in the middle of that verse, we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. So that's the foundation that needs to be established. And it's true in anything, if you don't establish a correct foundation, you will be in trouble as you proceed. And if we don't have a clear view of the issue of sin... And let me just say something to clarify here. We sometimes use, say that people are lost because they do not believe the gospel. There's an element of truth in that. But we have to be careful. Because Romans 1 is demonstrating people are lost if they never hear the gospel. So the foundational issue is people are lost because they are sinners. And the only hope for them to be rescued from their lostness to be redeemed, to experience salvation, is to believe in Christ. So it's true, uh, they are lost because they don't believe in Christ, but you want to be careful, because if you have that incorrect, there are some people who say then, well, people who never hear the gospel are not lost, because they can, cannot reject what they don't hear. So if you come across as saying, people go to hell because they don't believe the gospel, well, then people who don't hear the gospel and don't have a chance to believe it aren't lost. No, they are lost, all of us, because we are sinners. Now, the only hope and provision for our lostness is the gospel, which God provided through uh, the death and resurrection of his son. So just uh, don't want to uh, get overly technical but sometimes people begin into the discussion. Are people lost if they never hear the gospel? Yes, because they've been exposed to the revelation of creation. No matter where they are and what their condition, and everyone has responded negatively to that revelation. So we are lost and going to hell because we are sinners. That's why we carry the gospel to the lost. If they were only lost because they reject the gospel, we could say, well, let's not take the gospel to them, and then they won't reject it, and that'll be okay. No, we need to carry the gospel to them because they are already lost. And only by receiving the gospel by faith can they be rescued from their lostness. So Paul is establishing the lostness of all human beings, and everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, is exposed to natural creation. The revelation in creation. But he's particularly focused on the non-Jews here. Because he'll pick up in chapter 2. The Jews would agree. Of course the Gentiles are lost. 
uh, pagan sinners. But he's going to then deal with the fact that you Jews who have the special revelation of God are also lost because you reject the revelation of God as well. We've been moving through chapter 1. We see the basic issue is that men have rejected the revelation God has given. Uh, Verse 19, he revealed himself in creation. Verse 20, um, it says they are without excuse. God has made himself known. It's manifest. There's no excuse for ignorance on this matter. It's a willful suppressing is what is so clearly obvious. So verse 21 says, even though they knew God, not talking about a salvation knowledge, but they had the revelation of God that God had made manifest. So they knew there was a true and living God who had revealed something of his character in his creation. But they have rejected that. Uh, they didn't bow before him. They didn't become unreligious, if you will, or abandon religion. They just created their own. Uh, They worship the creation rather than the creator. And that can take various forms. Everything but the worship of the true and living God. Everything but honoring him and recognizing him as God is a form of idolatry. Man exalts his own ideas, his own beliefs, his own convictions. It becomes a matter of uh, placing himself in the place of God and putting his convictions, his beliefs, uh, above what the living God has revealed. So they became fools. They exchanged the glory of God. The result is God placed them under judgment. Sentence has been passed. We talk about the future dimension of God's wrath, which is an eternal hell. But there is a present dimension of the wrath of God going on continuously. As God turns people over to their own sin and the manifestation of that. And uh, we've been through some of this. Part of it is the rejection of his plan and creation of a man and a woman. And in one sense, that is part of the general revelation of God. It's manifest to everyone. And, but it is being clearly rejected and suppressed. And uh, the result, God turns them over and here they manifest their rejection. You see, the foundation for all sin is in the rejection of the revelation God has given and the replacing of the only true God with someone or something else of your own creation. And so all sin comes out of this. The judgment of God is you are condemned to the enslavement of your sin. And uh, it will consume you, become more and more manifest, overwhelming. And uh, we see displays of it. We display various displays of it today as it becomes more open and more broad as we are moving toward that climactic time, uh, which we studied about in the book of Revelation uh, after the rapture of the church, which will lead to the second coming of Christ to earth. We look through the unnatural passions that begin to overtake man. You cannot reject God and not experience the consequences. So at the foundational issue, and this is where we'll come through the rest of this chapter and into chapter 2, is the refusal to bow before God. We've been talking in Ecclesiastes. The fear of God, we talked about it Uh, In our study earlier today, the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom, knowledge. Um, When you've rejected God, you're out here without any true foundation. No objective standard outside of yourself. And for rejecting him, you've been condemned and sentenced to be controlled and corrupted and enslaved to your selfish sin. God gave them over. God gave them over. And we come down to verse 28. 
And incidentally, in this, you can see the foundational sin is the rejection of God. We sometimes think, well, at least they're religious. And we sometimes join forces. We talk about evangelicals at times because we have certain agreement in uh, certain convictions in moral or political areas. But you understand, false worship is the foundational sin. That's the issue out of which everything else comes. Um, so we want to be careful and recognize that. So for the third time, we're told in verse 28 in this chapter 1, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. He said that in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over. He said it again in verse 26. Therefore, God gave them over. Now we have it again. God gave them over. Each time reminding us the basis of this sentence is their rejection of God. Uh, they exchanged in verse 23 the glory of the incorruptible God. Um, therefore, God gave them over. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Therefore, God gave them over. And then the uh, homosexual desire, the rejection of God's creation plan for man as male and female, the expression of the sexual desires within the marriage relationship. Uh, they receive in their own persons the due penalty of their error, the end of verse 27, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God. Uh, they did not see fit. We're going to see a form of this word uh, a little further down. Um, it's a word that, uh, as the idea, you put something to the test to evaluate it to make up your mind. You know, you could test the metal to see if it's genuine. Uh, is it gold or is it something, uh, you know, imitation? They put it to the test. In effect, they have put God to the test and decided they would not acknowledge him. Uh, literally, not to have God in their knowledge. They are excluding God. Now, we find out they're religious. They worship. We saw that earlier in chapter 1. But they have excluded the true and living God. So we don't get over here. We say, well, they worship God. They, no, they don't, unless they worship him through Jesus Christ, based on the gospel of God, provided through the death and resurrection of Christ. Otherwise, they have decided to create their own religion, uh, their own worship. So they've decided not to have God in their knowledge. Um, we want to be careful on this. Um, anything else is a rejection of the true and living God. God cannot create. People say, well, you have your view, someone else has yours. Yes, but God makes himself known, and they've rejected him. They ought to have some understanding just of what was revealed in creation, as we have seen. They uh, have decided not to have God in their knowledge. Um, this is in line up in verse 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. You see, this emphasis, they knew God, down back in verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them or among them. That which is known is evident, manifest. Uh, they knew God. Wow, through the revelation of creation. I mean, to use the example of uh, the corruption of male and female as God created them to be that we've already looked at. Does it get any more obvious than that? The creative plan of God. Um, he made the male and female. We have an open denial and rejection of that. We have laws that have been passed that supposedly make okay the very relationships condemned here. So throughout all God's creation, and that 
we're talking about which is obvious to everyone, general revelation, man reflects, no, I'm not going to have God in my knowledge. But once you exclude him, where do you go? <laughs> Everything else is false. I mean, I use the example here. I want you to look everywhere for my watch. <laughs> well, some of you would like to <laughs> remind me of it. But you can't look up here. Well, will you ever find it? No. Um, when you've rejected the true and living God, where do you go? Everything else is an act of rebellion against him. So God again pronounced a sentence. God gave them over. God gave them over. Verse 28. They didn't see fit to have God in knowledge any longer. He revealed himself. They rejected that, suppressed what he revealed. They don't want it out. And come up with their own ideas. So God, again, the sentence is, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Uh, now, this is where I said we'll come to this word uh, they did not see fit. Now, this is a form of the same word. Uh, it's a word that means to put to the test. So, God gave them over to a depraved mind, a mind that failed his test. They put God to the test and decided not to acknowledge him, have him in their knowledge. God turned them over to a depraved mind, a mind that does not pass his test, if you will. Uh, depraved, failing the test, disqualified. So it means useless, reprobate, depraved. God in his sen has sentenced them to the control, domination of their depraved uh, mind, the mind that is unacceptable to him, that has not passed his test, that has been disqualified. Now, this is important because we see where the issue is. It is in the mind of man, the heart of man. It's within. God has made a uh, man has made a decision to reject God. Now, God, in his sentence of judgment, Sentences them to be controlled by that depraved mind that wants to exclude him and reject him and his truth. Um, so the result, they do the things which are not proper. I mean, there are consequences. So we see this pattern that is repeated. Uh, you see the connection between the mind and the actions. Come over to Romans 8. We continue as it develops more uh, fully the gospel. In Romans chapter 8, look at verse 7. Verse 6, the mind set on the flesh is death. You see, it's an internal thing. That's why all these sins, specific sins that we're talking about, have their basis in the decision of the mind to reject God and the judgment of God that sentences them to the control and uh, enslavement to the sin that they have chosen in rejecting God. So the mind set on the flesh is death, verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It doesn't subject itself to the law of God. It's not able to subject itself. Though those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So you need that transformation that places you in the spirit. We get to that. But this foundational issue, this is where man is in his sin. This is why only the power of the gospel can rescue him and redeem him. Uh, now note the order here. I should have put this up on a slide. Jeff asked me if I needed any slides. He's asked me for the last two weeks. No, I'm good. Then I said, oh, I should have put this on a slide. 
I'll just follow three steps. You can do it. Three parts. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. That's the foundational issue. They did not see fit to acknowledge God, to have God in knowledge. Second step, God gave them over to a depraved mind, to a mind that has failed the test, that is disqualified, that is reprobate, that is not able to please him. You're not causing them to sin, but the sentence is what their own sin has brought upon them in God's judgment. The third step is do the things to do the things which are not proper. And we're going to see a whole list of those things, I think 21 of them. Those are the things which are not proper. Now we're emphasizing this so we see where it starts. They refuse to have God in their knowledge. That's the foundational issue. Until that is resolved, they are under the control of a reprobate mind which manifests itself in all kinds of sin. They are under the judgment of God. You see what's going on in the world around us, in our own country? The more open, evident manifestation of the wrath of God as sin becomes more and more open, more and more blatant, more and more encouraged and promoted as normal and acceptable. So we can have a man who was a presidential candidate, supposedly married to another man, say, God made me this way. If you don't agree with it, your problem's with my God. I mean, how do we get any more blatant than that? And I'm not picking him out as a weird sinner. It's just a manifestation of where we are, even at the highest levels. So the conduct is a result of God's judgment, which is a result of man's rejection of him. If we start at point three, people are doing the things which are not proper. We need to clean up our society. We haven't dealt with the issue. This is a manifestation of God's judgment, the sin we see everywhere. And God's judgment is on them because of their rejection of him, refusal to have him in knowledge. That's why we need the power of the gospel to intervene in here, because it's the heart which is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. So cleaning up the outside of the tomb doesn't clean up the inside as Jesus' picture was with the Jews of the day. Whitewashed tombs. And as where if we're not careful and understand the foundational issues, we can get involved in trying to whitewash tombs. Well, if you didn't do this, God would be much more pleased. God is not pleased with people who have rejected him. He wasn't more pleased with the Jews. We'll get that to chapter 2. Even though they would have considered homosexuality as a sin that's totally outside the bounds of what they would ever do. They're just as lost. So these things that are being established here are foundational. So he goes on. They're doing the things which are not proper. These things come from a mind that has failed the test. Uh, that is disapproved. As a result of having rejected God, God's sentence is, now you are enslaved, controlled, and dominated by your sin, and it will manifest itself in all kind of ugly and ultimate self-destructing ways. That's the sentence. You cannot undo the sentence. The only rescue is in Jesus Christ. The purpose of this is not to say clean up your life. Um, you can't do it. The problem comes from the mind that has been rejected. Come back to Mark, Mark chapter 7. I uh, quoted from Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. This was Jesus' instruction during his time on earth in Mark chapter 7. And he's dealing with the issue of external things cannot deal with your problem. You're not defiled by what you eat and those kind of external things. 
defilement comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. Uh, that's his point. Verse 20. That which proceeds out of the man is that which defiles the man. Um, I, you'd think we would have this clear by now, but I was reading in a book this week, and it's a recent book. The man was talking about certain conduct, and we won't, don't want to do that because that will defile us. Well, there's a defiling about sin, but the real problem is you have to deal with the inside because Jesus said what? Verse 21, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of covenant, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within. That's why we read in Romans chapter 8, that the mindset on the flesh is death. What you have to do is be made new and have the Spirit. Not try to, well, I'm not going to slander anymore and I'm going to quit coveting and I'll stop being immoral. And, but wait a minute, you're just trying to whitewash a tomb. You have to get back. The mind, the heart, the inner person is the issue. We won't go back there. But Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23, puts it this way. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Ethiopia, the skin was black. Could he change his skin, the color? Or the leopard, his spots? Then you also can do good who are accustomed to do evil. In other words, it's impossible to change what you are. And that's, if the Ethiopian could change his skin and the leopard could change his spots, then you also can do good who are accustomed to do evil. The point is, it's not possible. It's not possible. Uh, these external things just manifest what we are internally. Come back to Romans 1. So we have a list of 21 vices or sins that uh, show the consequences which manifest the consequences of man's rejection of God, of rejecting God and replacing him with something else. In our day, we talk about secular humanism and those kind of things, but just a form of idolatry. We reject God. We have ideas and things of our own creation that explain reality. Um, we're not going to go through a breakdown. They break down these lists. But we're just going to go through the item because what he's just doing is giving a sampling. And there are a number of these kinds of lists in the New Testament. I went through and had over 15 of them. Um, that uh, I did here again this past week just to look and see what are. Uh, and sometimes we just read it in Mark chapter 7 where Jesus said, out of the heart, and he lists all these things. At different times, God brings these things out. They're not all, everything in the list is not exactly the same because what he's saying is the evil that comes out of the heart that has rejected him, it can take all kinds of forms. And we want to be careful that we don't become like the Jews. Proud that we don't do the sins that the Gentiles do, the non-Jews. Uh, but being religious and being more moral, quote, than maybe some other people doesn't make us less sinful in the sight of God. So we'll just run down through this list and you'll see the emphases. Verse 29 picks up, being filled with. And uh, that pictures, you know, one uh, Greek commentator said on this word. It means be filled to the brim. And the perfect tense is having been filled with, and this is what fills them um, to this day. You know, this is what is in there, and it just keeps bubbling out. 
How many of us who are a little older say, boy, I would have never thought that sin could become so open, so openly accepted and openly promoted. But it's just filling there. It's just almost like just waiting for the opportunity to be able to demonstrate itself. We don't find the world generally, it's limited to our country, uh, aghast that these things are going on. We find people supporting it, encouraging it, finding reason to say it's good. They're filled with all unrighteousness. Um, obviously, this form of righteousness will be used a number of times in the New Testament. Uh, back in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. It gets connected often with ungodliness. Why? Because unrighteousness, God who is righteous and provides righteousness is rejected. So in the rejection, rejection of God, we reject righteousness. I mean, they go hand in hand. It's the opposite. Unrighteousness would be the opposite of righteousness. Wickedness. It's a word for depravity, iniquity, evil purposes, desires. And it carries the idea of a desire to corrupt and do harm. Um, the word related for this word Poneria is used in 1 John for the devil. He is the evil one. And that's this word. Instead of, you could translate it the wicked one, but it's the evil one. 1 John 2, 13 and 14, 3, 12, 5, 18 and 19. By chapter 1 John 5, 18 and 19, the whole world lies in the evil one. That's his word. Yeah, you see, we're like the devil. Because we're the devil's children. And we do the desires of our father, the devil, as Jesus said, of unregenerate people, the religious people of his day. But it's characteristic. Next word is greed. Uh, greed. Uh, the desire to have more, the relentless produce. We call it materialism. Um, and the Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Greed is idolatry. So you see, idolatry is just not for those darkened parts of the land where maybe they create an idol and worship. It's what you set up in your mind as your controller, the one you strive to uh, please. Greed, more, more. Um, they're really worshiping someone other than God. Uh, we live in a materialistic society. Even that's not surprising um, because we live in a fallen world. Malice, another word for evil, kakia. Sort of has a, that sound. Uh, there's something uh, bad about it. This is the most general word in the Greek language for evil. So it has a broad Significance. This is a person who's destitute of every quality which would make him good. You know, you see, the corruption of sin is pervasiveness. We would say we are rotten to the core. That's what God's evaluation is. That's a result of his judgment. That the sin now consumes us. You just cannot reject God and not have consequences. And consequences are the judgment he pours out that now, you know, it's like you go to a doctor and he says you have cancer, it can be cured, but you reject that uh, doctor. And it continues what? It's judgment. Well, here's what will happen. Here's the consequences of your rejection. I mean, this is what sin does. Even we as believers, we begin to look around and we see people, well, they're not so bad. I know good people. I think their intentions are good. I think, but you know, whitewashed tombs are no better on the inside. So they're full of malice. Uh, now we repeat full of again. A uh, little different word, but it means something that's been stuffed full. Uh, you know, full to overflowing, now stuffed full. The point is these are just not isolated. 
little, you know, areas. Well, if we could deal with this, I think they'd be all right. If we could just deal with this, correct with this. You see what God wants to say? This is what fills a person. They're filled to overflowing. They're stuffed full. Uh, This is the condition of fallen man under the judgment of God for the rejection of him. Envy. Um, And the word, it resents what others have. You know, I not only uh, am greedy, I resent what other people have that I don't have. And often out of envy come all kind of other sins. Murder's next. Oh, here's a really bad one. You know, we end to think envy, uh, greed. Well, it's just the world we live in. Murder, that is serious. And it isn't a serious sin. It's the sin that requires capital punishment. And the Noahic covenant for governmental uh, carrying out of the rule within God's creation murder uh, and it's openly practiced oh yeah we say it it breaks out everywhere but you know we've already devalued life i mentioned this morning abortion 61 million babies aborted since the law was passed that that was legal uh, down to 1918 in our own country 61 million we think what a terrible thing it was six million jews were killed in Nazi Germany, we've killed 61 million babies since the early 1970s when it became approved as acceptable practice. We think nothing of it. And then it's manifest in other ways in the world as well. It comes part of our selfishness. And we want to be in charge. What do we say? It's the woman's body. God's not in the picture here. He has nothing to say about it. When our courts made a decision this would be acceptable practice and approved, didn't say we have consulted God. Uh, We reject God. We set ourselves up to overrule him. Murder. You see a breakout in the world. You know, uh, just it gets worse and worse. Strife. This is the contention, you know, if you're envious and greedy and all, there's going to be conflict because, you know, you've got to get to the top. You've got to have this, the desire, everything uh, in the heart that's corrupt. There's going to be strife. There's going to be deceit. A person has a twisted mind, as one perder put it. Can't act in a straightforward way. Stoops to devious and underhanded methods to get his own way. Never does anything except with some kind of ulterior motive. Uh, It describes the crafty cunning of the plotting intriguer who is found in every community, every society. Look at our government. Who can figure out who's honest and who's not? Who's functioning for this and who's not? I mean, you know, you think can... You know, everybody is saying the opposite things and claiming it's true. And you think, are there ulterior motives here? Are we more concerned about this or this? Uh, Yes. Are there ulterior motives? Yes. Are people acting with deceit? Yes. Though they shouldn't do that. No, they shouldn't. You know why they do it? They're under the judgment of God for rejecting him. Malice. They're doing what they choose. Evil character. So we're only halfway through Paul's list. Um, You know, we think, well, uh, the point is the gospel is the only hope. I mean, which of these are you going to fix? How do you fix it? Well, there ought to be honesty in government. Uh, we'll use that as an example because it's visible for all of us. Integrity, good motives. It, uh, well, that'd be desirable, and men are accountable for not doing that. Uh, even unbelievers will give an account for God. Uh, rulers are placed in position for certain things. Justice is uh, going to be meted out on all those who misuse their position. But the fact is we can't fix it just with external things. Now, we're talking about sins here, 
Maybe it's a good point for me to make another theological point. Sometimes we say God loves the sinner and hates the sin. But you have to be careful about that again theologically. You can't separate sin from the sinner. What is this a man of these sins a manifestation of? A heart and mind that has rejected God in suppressing the truth concerning him. So sin has, it's not like sin is something just floating in the air and God hates it. We said, what did Jesus say? It's out of the heart of man these things come. Um, it's a reprobate mind. A mind set on the flesh as we saw in Romans 8. And so the Bible tells us God hates the sinner because that's where the sin comes from. When Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't punish the sin. He punished the one who did the sin. I mean, we want to be careful. Now, it's also true God loves the sinner, for God so loved the world. That while we were yet sinners, we'll get to in Romans 5. Uh, God demonstrates his love. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you say, well, can both be true? Yes, it is. He hates us in our sin, but in love he provided a Savior for us and calls us to salvation. Um, we can't pick and choose. Well, what part of God's character do I want to choose to believe? So many of the world you can talk about. God generally and his love and well you can get by with that but you talk about his wrath his judgment that's just as much his character God hates the sinner we won't turn there right now but Psalm 5 verses 5 and 6 Psalm 11 verse 5 just a couple of verses there that tell you God hates the sinner you can't separate sin from the sinner and the world does that. He's not a bad person. It just, he killed them. And now we have hate crimes. So if someone kills me for my money but didn't hate me, is that any worse or less worse? I mean, capital punishment was meted out for striking at the image of God and murdering someone. Doesn't talk about a. So we create all these nebulous ideas and, you know, you can't uh, separate sin from the sinner. That's all I want to be sure we're clear on. And there's, oh, God wouldn't pour his wrath on people. He loves people. But he hates sin. Oh, well, where does sin come from? I mean, sin is the action of people who have rejected God in rebellion against God, even as believers. When we sin, we are rebelling against God. It's only God's gracious provision that assures us the continuing forgiveness. But sin is an act of rebellion against God. Uh, all right, let's look on. Verse 29. We are filled with uh, all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of ma envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers. Pick up the gospel into slanders because uh, they go connected here. A gossip, slander, I'll make the distinguishing gossiping is what goes on behind people's backs. Slandering is done more uh, uh, openly. Uh, gossips is one of those words, you know, when you want to say, oh, that whispering goes on. Psst, 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 psst. Well, that's the Greek word, starts out P-S-I, or the first three letters, as we would have it in English. So you have that sound, gossips, uh, this word. It's you try to uh, undermine people's reputation. Uh, you misrepresent them. You know, gossip, but we talk about it, that's not good. You know, you're passing on something about someone behind their back. Uh, and... You know, there's a secretness to a slander. The next one, uh, and uh, commentators commenting on the difference in these words, what gossips do secretly, slanders do openly. 
uh, you know, and pass it on in a more open, flagrant way. Now we have the internet. You can say whatever you want about whoever you want. Put it out there. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 20 puts these two words together. Gossip, slander. Now you have to be careful. This can become a problem among believers in the churches. I mean, we want to be careful. This is not an acceptable. This is listed as characteristic ones who are in rebellion against God. It doesn't become less sin if I, as a Christian, gossip. As I'm functioning now out of character, resisting the Spirit, refusing to submit to His control in this area. Uh, sin is not less sin when it's done uh, by a person who has been redeemed. Uh, Paul had to rebuke Peter, remember, in Galatians 2, because he didn't function consistently. Um, so he'd had to be rebuked, corrected, and we do that as believers. These people are haters of God. Now, you see how these sins are mixed together? Because we like to categorize them as better. We put gossip and slander, and the next word is, hate, uh, next, uh, word is haters of God. Oh, but to hate God, that's, I mean, that's really, but that's where they are. That's sort of foundational back to where we were. But this is part of what they do. They've suppressed the truth concerning him. They've rejected the revelation of him. They really hate God. Uh, this is consistent with suppressing the truth. Uh, exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God for one of their own creation, uh, exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And people get very antagonistic when you bring the truth of the living God uh, to bear on them. Next word, you know, we sometimes talk about hubris. Uh, is, you know, pride, arrogance, that's this word just carried over from Greek, hubris. Um, and here's what one Greek commentator said, it's best understood here as signifying the man who in his confidence in his own superior power, wealth, status, strength, intellectual or other abilities, treats fellow men with insolent contemptuousness. Uh, let me see this. Arrogance, um, you know, self-importance, self-esteem, we see this, uh, you know, Alvinianpi, we see it in our government. And the, even the world has a hard time, you know. They don't like certain sins manifest in people. They are, their sins are all right, but sins manifest in others. Uh, they won't reject, uh, re, uh, respect the proper place. That, uh, you know, they don't fit into the system because they come, what, I'm more important than you. I have better ideas than you. You're old school. You're done with. You're out of here. I'm important, uh, that kind of pride, arrogance. Paul says uh, this characterized him before he was saved. He uses this word in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, when he gives his testimony of what he's like before his conversion. I was a violent aggressor. That's this word. You know, insolent, a violent aggressor. Uh, you, will, you know, Run over anybody else because you are so important. Uh, arrogant. Uh, what is the word that's used when uh, James writes, God resists the proud? The arrogant people? God stands against them. Um, boastful. Person who wants to blame uh, Impress others, you know, we have to be careful. We can all stretch the truth. We want to make ourselves important. Uh, these last three words, insolent, arrogant, boastful, all have this idea of the unbeliever trying to exalt himself. Uh, you know, we try to make it a, a positive quality in our world, and somehow even evangelicals got involved in a self-esteem. We want our kids to grow up with self-esteem when the emphasis of Scripture is humility. Uh, but we want you to be, we call it confidence, but it's really arrogance. 
doesn't mean we deny abilities God has given us. And if you do your best and you do better than someone else, a proper attitude would be thank God for the grace he's given you with a good mind that maybe has uh, more abilities than someone else has with their mind, but someone else has more abilities maybe than you do in another area. Uh, but we've had to pump our kids up. You're the most important. You're the... So they get to be of an age where they display their arrogance and they don't have to listen to anyone. And then you find, you know, teenagers and that killing someone because he disrespected me. What do you mean disrespected you? Well, you know, we know what it means. He's, he views himself as so important. Um, the... Uh, we try to make um, something that God says is sin something that we want to promote. So we had self-esteem courses. Then we had theologians say, Christ died for you because you were so valuable. It wasn't because of grace. It wasn't because of mercy. It was because he would get. You were valuable. Uh, what about this is God's love for us, demonstrated when we were sinners. Christ died for us. You're telling me sinners are valuable in that? Christ didn't die for me because I was so valuable. He died for me because God is a God of grace and love and mercy. I mean, I was fit for hell as every other sinner. He didn't die for me because there was value in me. Um, they are inventors of evil. Um, there's no end to it. Uh, inventors of evil. I mean, they're always coming up with new ideas and expressing their depravity. Disobedient to parents. I mean, wait, wait a minute. Some of these, you see, as far as God's concerned, we pull these out and say, let's make the worst sins, list the worst sins, then let's, let's list the next level sins, and then let's list the sins that, well, we would like not to have them practice. They're not. God just mixes them all together because sin is a manifestation of what? A heart and mind that is in rebellion against him. So... Disobedient to parents, and we talked a little bit about this this morning. This sin is also listed by Paul in a list he gives in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Because it strikes at the heart of God's foundational creation, as we looked at earlier in our study today, of what? The family. There's a foundational relationship for society. A man, a woman, joined in marriage, having children. And an order established, the man subject to God, the woman subject to the man, and the children subject to the parents, both uh, uh, the father and the mother. But there is a breakdown of the basic structure of, uh, that God has established. Shouldn't happen. And as we talked this morning, a wife shouldn't be in rebellion against her husband. Reject his leadership. Children shouldn't be. We what? We have children's power. We have to keep children. They have rights. They have authority. We're not talking about abusing children. We're just talking about the authority. Children shouldn't have a say. I mean, uh, they're disobedient to parents. It just breaks out everywhere. They don't have to obey anyone. Then they go to school. They don't have to obey their parents. Why do they have to obey the teacher? Then they go someplace else. I don't have to obey my teacher. I don't have to obey my parents. I don't have to obey you. I remember my dad told me if a policeman, when I was a kid, a little kid, some things stick with you. Um, he said to me, if a policeman ever tells you to stop, you stop. If you turn and run away, he'll shoot you in the back and it will be your fault. Why? Because you didn't obey. Nowadays, poor policemen have to hope they're stronger and wrestle them to the ground and uh, do everything. I'm not advocating. I'm just explaining. Uh, do with it what you will. Uh, this is a rejection of what God has said is to be done. Disobedient to parents is just as sinful as any of the other things here. 
It's not acceptable. We as parents ought to be enforcing that. If we allow our little children to be in rebellion against us and no consequences, am I enforcing scripture? Or am I saying your sin is okay in this house? Well, I wouldn't let them murder in this house. I wouldn't want them being sexually immoral in this house. But I don't discipline when they disobey. Oh, certain sins are okay. Um, We want to be consistent. They are without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And uh, we're out of time. But that word unloving is uh, not used as a regular word. But it refers... Uh, It's a special Greek word for family relationships, family love. And this refers to there's not the natural, normal family love. The love between a husband and a wife, it breaks down. The love between parent and child. Remember, we read Proverbs, if you don't discipline your children, you don't love them. And the love of children for their parents and respecting them and obeying them. And the breakdown. And, of course, the inconvenience, so we go to abortion. And I have some material on that from Roman times. The father had the power of life and death. A newborn baby could be pre- presented and laid at the feet of the father. If he picked it up, it was to be spared. If he didn't, it was to be carried out, killed, maybe placed out in a public way. A slave trader may pick up. Uh, some of those babies and raise them so they could uh, sell them as slaves and make money. Um, they could uh, put them outside and let the ravenous dogs. They said, well, that's a disgrace. It's a disgrace goes on all the time in our country. Now they want to talk about uh, letting a parent decide whether the child ought to live after they're born. They say, where does it stop? The natural family love and a tie, and the love that binds a family is just gone. Uh, and listen to this. One Greek commentator, I don't even think he's a believer uh, from my reading of him, but he said, never was the life of the child so precious, precarious at this to- as at this time. Children were considered a misfortune. You know what happens when uh, you know, they get in the way. We're not as concerned about family. We're as con- more concerned about success, about what we can acquire, uh, how we can enjoy things. You know, children are a bother. And they take away from our wealth because they drain the resources and they're just an inconvenience. Uh, nothing's new. Well, we have to stop there. So I'll say verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. Reflect on that verse. Think about our country. Think about decisions that have been made at high levels that encourage certain behaviors. They not only uh, are accepted or tolerated, they are encouraged and normalized. But we'll stop there. All this, what? The only hope is the gospel. That's why you need the power of the gospel. You see that we as believers can sometimes lose sight of the terrible condition that we were in before we got saved. We were just like them, Paul says. Paul told Titus, remind them. They were just like them. Because pretty soon we see the I, them in the sense, oh, they're such vile sinners. I don't know how God puts up with it. Of course, I never was like that. But when God looked at my heart, he saw the same thing until his grace intervened and redeemed. So we praise him for that grace. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It's clarity. And Lord, it is an ugly picture. It is pitiful. But we are responsible. The awful consequences of rejecting you the living God, of trying to put ourselves in your place, putting our words above your words. Lord, we are testimonies of your grace. We will be for eternity. Uh, A reminder that sinners deserving of hell 
can be rescued, cleansed, and forgiven because of the depths of your love, mercy, and grace in providing your Son to be our Savior. Thank you for the power of the gospel, which is a power for salvation to everyone who believes. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.